well, thanks again for the uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are around the world. Um, uh, thanks for joining us. Um, uh, I'm going to be talking today about human understanding for HoloLens, and I'll, I'll go into what that means uh, in a moment. Um, before I do, I wanted to first of all acknowledge the um, huge collaboration and teamwork across Microsoft that goes into a product such as HoloLens. Um, this, is a, this is a big effort. Um, and also uh, to acknowledge and, and uh, my gratitude to the whole computer vision and, and CBPR community um, for the you know, decades of, of fantastic research uh, that underpins you know, everything that I, I will be talking about today. Um, we really are standing on the, the shoulders of giants with, uh, with this. Um, so with that, I'm going to start by uh, introducing uh, HoloLens and in fact HoloLens 2. This is the second edition of, of HoloLens. Uh, I have one here. Um, I can stick it on my head. Uh, I can turn it up so I can see you a bit better. Um, but we designed HoloLens 2 with um, three pillars uh, uh, around it. So one, the immersion, the fact that you can get a, a really good field of view, you can interact with it as we'll see in this talk uh, with your hands in a very instinctual way. Comfort, you can stick it on, you can flip up the visor, flip it down when you want to. Um, trivial to take on, very comfortable to wear for a long uh, period of time. And time to value, which means you can take it out of the box, put it on and, and actually get going pretty quickly. You don't have to wait uh, for months and months while you develop new stuff. There's already stuff um, on there. And it's just one example. Um, in, the, in the recent past, we've been uh, trialing HoloLens 2 in London at the Imperial uh, Imperial College Healthcare Hospital, um, where doctors doing ward rounds around intensive care have been able to put this on um, and, uh, and interact with the patients, but more importantly, interact with remote experts who, don't, who no longer have to walk around the ward as well. Uh, and so they're able to get uh, you know, the benefits of having lots of experts uh, to treat a patient, but without, with, with fewer uh, ward hours and with less risk of, risk of infection. Um, furthermore, the uh, ability for the doctor to interact with the device uh, using their hands, um, as, you'll, as we'll be talking about later on, um, without needing a controller, uh, me makes it much easier. They don't have to put, uh, sterilize, worry about sterilizing uh, controllers uh, on a regular basis. Um, so back to the device, I think it's always fun uh, to have a look into the hardware, um, and it's always amazing not just uh, with devices like HoloLens, but, but all sort of AR and, and VR devices out there, just the wealth of hardware innovation that's going on in addition to um, all the software. So here in HoloLens 2, we've got a bunch of cameras, head tracking cameras, hand tracking cameras, eye tracking cameras. Uh, we've got uh, laser scanning displays. Uh, we've got, um, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, embedded compute processors on there. Um, and it really does take all of this to come together to enable the kinds of experiences that we'll be uh, looking at in a moment. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, human understanding and representation um, with, a, uh, with a, a view on into sort of three topics uh, today. Instinctual interaction. Uh, this is looking at how we uh, designed, built uh, the interaction model on HoloLens and made that work. Uh, and then looking more into the future, uh, a little bit on synthetic data uh, and neural rendering, which are very exciting uh, areas at the moment. And I'll be looking um, uh, uh, you know, across this uh, and really looking at the, the wearer of the HoloLens. So I put on the device, um, what can I sense about me, the wearer, rather than the people around them, around you? So let's dive in and we're going to start uh, by talking about uh, the uh, articulated hand tracking system on HoloLens 2. And the goal here is to be able to, to from the viewpoint, from the egocentric viewpoint of the camera, uh, uh, with my hands in front of me, uh, for, for, me, for the, the system to be able to accurately track the detailed articulated motion um, of your fingers. So I recorded a couple of videos this afternoon, which I'll, I'll play you. I didn't uh, dare risk uh, the, 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 um, doing a live demo, um, but uh, here we go. Um, as I stick my hands in front of uh, this, uh, you can see a sort of mesh that's appearing on my fingers. 
Um, uh, I can uh, fully articulate them, move them around in arbitrary ways. I can start interacting with things in the environment, pressing buttons, playing the piano, uh, controlling sliders. In a moment, I'll, I'll pick up uh, something from a distance and bring it close. And there I can start to interact even two-handed. Uh, and it, it's very akin to um, how you do uh, uh, 2D interactions, uh, touch interactions, pinch zoom and, and the like. Uh, and of course, you can have a bit of fun. So this is a, a, a set, uh, another app, uh, with a slightly different visualization of the hands. And uh, here I'm uh, sort of writing a little note um, to CVPR. And um, you can bring up a menu, uh, lock to the hand. And this is just sort of really demonstrating both the fidelity of the tracking that we're able to achieve and the kinds of interactions that uh, you're able to uh, generate when you get this uh, when you get this up and running. So, looking at this uh, more technically, what are the uh, challenges that we have to overcome? Uh, you know, there's a huge variety of poses. Uh, there's a lot of self occlusion. Uh, there's globe, full global rotations, and you've got to worry about, the, of course, the frame rate and the latency of the system, given this is a uh, a live and interactive system. Uh, there's been huge progress over really the last couple of decades um, uh, or more uh, in this field across across the community, um, looking at all sorts of uh, input from stereo, RGB, depth, uh, etc. Uh, we've been uh, using for both HoloLens 1 and HoloLens 2, we've been using a depth camera and uh, in HoloLens 2 this is a phase-based time of flight uh, imager. Uh, it's very similar to uh, the, the, the depth camera that goes into the Azure Connect development kit that you see uh, in the top left there. And you get the kind of view of the hand that you see in the bottom right there. Um, now, while there has been fantastic progress in RGB only tracking, uh, you, you, for the kinds of interactions where you're going to be pressing uh, buttons and you need very precise um, uh, information in the Z direction, uh, a depth cameras have proven uh, really invaluable at getting you that, uh, that absolute depth uh, information. And we started this journey um, quite a few years ago. Here's our very first uh, attempt at this, um, and it kind of half worked, but it was rather brittle. Um, so uh, I, I had to hold my hand exactly as I'm, I'm doing here, and it occasionally drops out. Um, but it showed us hope that there was, uh, you know, some uh, some hope for, for succeeding at this. But where, we, where I feel, felt we really um, got some traction in our efforts here was uh, our 2015 paper, uh, where we got it working quite nicely across um, a variety of, of users and at a, a, at a reasonable frame rate. Uh, but this system was rather too expensive. And um, if we opened up the box, uh, we maxed out what was then a state-of-the-art uh, GTX 680. Um, uh, don't worry, no eggs were harmed in the filming of this video. Um, and we knew that this was not going to be something that could uh, ever, uh, this algorithm would never be something that would quite fit on, um, on a head. Um, and so we went back to the drawing board and um, this resulted in uh, the SIGGRAPH paper, which I'll talk in a little bit more detail about in a moment. Uh, and this is the first time as well that we started looking at the egocentric view and, and building, um, uh, sort of natural uh, affordances in VR that we could then uh, play around with um, like this. The other thing we, we uh, invested in heavily here was trying to improve the speed of this, this algorithm so that it could run uh, just on a desktop CPU without needing uh, a, a big GPU. And I think we got about two orders of magnitude over the 2015 paper here. Now, how did we do that? Well, um, a, a couple of themes in this, in this work. One was a, um, a use of a smooth subdivision surface representation um, that, uh, for, our, for our model. Um, and so we'd take a neutral mesh, we'd be able to pose that with some parameter vector theta, uh, and then from that uh, posed mesh, we could generate a, a smooth subdivision surface, which is where our, our model energy, our model fitting energy would try and um, align the data to. Um, and one of the benefits of this is you get fewer local minima in your optimization. And so comparing to, a, say, a piecewise planar uh, surface on the right here, 
uh, we were able to um, fit the data uh, much more uh, reliably and, and with much uh, many fewer local minima and, and converge to a, a decent solution from quite a wide basin, basin of convergence. Um, furthermore, um, another theme in this work was the, the use of joint optimization of both pose and correspondences. And so compared to the articulated ICP uh, alternative where you alternate between uh, optimizing pose and correspondences, we found we were able to converge to a good solution uh, far faster, far fewer iterations. And both of these uh, things uh, were part of the uh, reasons for the, the big speed improvement over our previous uh, approach. And so if you look at the overall architecture here, um, it looks a bit like this. Uh, you have a depth camera uh, as input, uh, you run a hand detector to extract a region of interest around the hand, um, you take the result from the previous frame, so this is a tracking solution for the moment, and that gives you a starting point for your optimization, and you throw that into a, an energy minimization um, framework, uh, minimize that, and you get to some local minimum. Now, of course, uh, any kind of gradient-based uh, optimization may get stuck in a local minimum. Um, and so to improve robustness uh, to that, we used machine learning to predict various reinitialization pose, re reinitialization poses. So for example, this theta one here, which might start in a different basin of the energy landscape. And uh, you run the energy minimization, converge to a, a local minimum, compare all the minima you've seen so far, and take that as your uh, next result for the next frame. So this was uh, the algorithm as it stood um, uh, in 2016. We were, we were proud of the paper and we also saw the opportunity uh, to try and take this uh, into product and, and to get this into HoloLens. Uh, and we went into this with uh, you know, eyes wide open that this was gonna be a, an interesting learning journey. Um, and it really was quite a, a, a journey. Um, we started by, uh, you know, you start by diving into a product um, by uh, thinking about the requirements that are going to be needed from the product perspective. So, of course, you've already got, always got uh, things like frame rate, latency, accuracy, robustness that uh, any, anyone's going to have to worry about uh, when, uh, when uh, building a, a system. But uh, when it comes to actually shipping it out of the door, you've got to worry, especially on a head-worn device, you've got to worry about the fact that uh, you're thermally limited. You don't want to get the device too hot. You've got to worry about the industrial design and that the impact that will have on the sensor layout and the sensor, what the sensors can see. Um, and perhaps most uh, pr uh, pressingly for us was the fact that we had to fit this um, all onto a fairly low-powered in, uh, embedded processor, which comes with a lot of challenges. And so we took our, our algorithm and ported it onto the holographic processing unit of the, of the HoloLens uh, and immediately found that we were about 200 times too slow, um, which uh, certainly got, uh, uh, got us a little bit nervous. Uh, but at this point, it was far too, uh, far too late to pull out. So we had to press on uh, nonetheless. Um, and, and thankfully we did, because we, we got there. And um, you can see on the, the right, this is sort of the, the progress over time. Each dot here is a check-in in our code. Um, and you can see the number of iterations of model fitting that we could do per second. Of course, you've got you know, 30 or 60 frames per second coming off the camera. Um, uh, and you've got to do multiple iterations per frame. Um, but we got our, our number up very nicely and simultaneously were able to improve the accuracy and robustness. Now, of course, a lot of this um, is sort of low level optimizations, code optimizations and, you know, intrinsics and assembler and, and, and the very low level stuff. But, but there's no way you get a factor of 200 just by doing that. And there was uh, actually a lot of algorithmic innovation that had to uh, go into this as well. And so as a couple of examples. Um, we, uh, we had been using this smooth subdivision surface model, uh, which was uh, great for the energy landscape, but very expensive, relatively very expensive to evaluate uh, in our energy terms. Uh, and compared to that triangle mesh, right, we, we, uh, we had a much better convergence, um, but, uh, but the triangle mesh is cheaper to evaluate. Uh, but we worked out uh, that uh, you could get effectively the best of both worlds by taking uh, a smooth shading approximation 
um, and interpolating the normals in a, in a, a manner very similar to Fong shading and graphics. And that gave us the, the cheap evaluation and the smooth, uh, most of the smooth energy landscape uh, and kept, uh, kept things uh, ticking along very nicely. The other major part was uh, uh, better use of deep learning. So uh, the HPU has a, a small DNN accelerator. It's very, very efficient, but it's also very, uh, you know, very uh, computationally constrained. And so we had to work out how to get the kind of um, results for semantic segmentation and key point detection that you see in the right using um, really very tiny uh, neural networks. Once we had those, uh, we could go back to the architecture I showed you before and, and plug those in. Uh, so replace uh, those learned predictions with this region of interest DNN. Um, and then not only use that for reinitialization poses, but, but actually feed that in uh, the, the segmentations and key points directly into the energy and thereby change the energy landscape. And this flattens uh, the energy a lot, uh, reduced uh, a lot of the local minima, uh, which improved convergence. Um, and reduced the number of uh, starting points that we'd have to look at considerably. Again, uh, this is both improving the efficiency and the robustness and accuracy of the system. So that was, uh, that's a whirlwind tour of the hand tracker in HoloLens. Now to get the kinds of interactions that I showed you earlier, we actually have to go beyond hand tracking uh, and into eye tracking as well. Um, so I'll show you a quick demo video of the eye tracking in, in HoloLens. It's a little hard to see um, because you kind of have to experience it for yourself. But here's a map. Uh, and I just zoomed in um, by dragging my hand. But now the rest of this is um, all eye control. So just through my eye gaze, I'm looking at the, the sides of the map here. Um, and the HoloLens is able to sense where I'm looking. Uh, and and it's, it's tracking the map as I move uh, around. So I'm doing a nice little... Uh, tour of uh, Lake Washington there uh, and back into Seattle. Um, a, another example of the same thing here is, is this example of scrolling some text. So again, as my eyes come lower down uh, into this, uh, it starts to scroll uh, the text automatically and back up again there. So the eye tracking um, gives you that the gaze vector, which was what was being used in that demo. But it's also uh, super important uh, to get the uh, IPD, the interpupillary distance, which allows uh, the accurate depth uh, perception that you need when you're uh, trying to uh, reach out and press buttons uh, that, are, that are quite small. Uh, and it also helps deal with any um, twist of the HoloLens on your head to improve uh, the visual comfort. And how does it work? Well, very, very similar at a high level to the hand tracking. Um, so very similar hybrid of discriminative and generative approaches. We take the, the views from the uh, eye, eye tracking cameras, which are about here, looking at your eyes. There's a sequence of LEDs, IR LEDs, uh, that illuminate your eyes and give these glints uh, that you see in the image there. We use some deep learning to extract the features uh, extract regions um, in, the, in the images and the glint positions in those. And then we have an eye model, uh, a, a conceptual eye model uh, that uh, we can then use a very similar model fitting uh, energy based minimization uh, to get uh, the final result that, that we use there. And so, you know, this is what, um, what it takes to, to generate those kind of um, instinctual interactions. Uh, you need the hand tracking, you need the eye tracking, you need all of the uh, phenomenal hardware, the displays, um, and of course, a, uh, a developer surface as well. So the first uh, demo I showed you was a, a, something called Mixed Reality Toolkit, which is the set of widgets that, uh, that you can uh, easily put together into your application uh, to, to allow you to interact um, in the way that I showed. So with that, I'm going to move on to uh, the next uh, part of my talk on synthetic data. So this is something I've been um, passionate about for, for many years now. But you might be asking, why, why should you care about synthetic data? I've got great uh, real training data already. And there's a number of reasons. Here's, here's a few. Um, perhaps most importantly, uh, you, can, you have precise control of what goes into your data set. Uh, you have uh, 
and you know we all know um, in the in the community right now that there's a huge problem with bias in our data sets in in in, in all of our vision data sets and, and AI uh, approaches, um, and that is as as vision and AI gets uh, deeper and deeper into society, that's having more and more uh, impact on the world. And so I think there's increasing urgency to address this. And synthetic data allows you to massively increase your diversity and very simply, um, as you'll see in a, in a second. Secondly, you can get really high quality labels. There's no error uh, in the annotation. There's no noise. And uh, perhaps more interestingly, you can generate labels that are impossible or you know, incredibly expensive to annotate by hand. And if you're dealing with uh, devices like HoloLens, where you've got funny cameras in different parts of the spectrum, uh, depth cameras, for example, or multi-camera setups, you can very quickly and easily uh, get full control of those and render exactly what you'd like. But to make uh, synthetic data good, uh, you really need to sort of uh, act, uh, work, across, uh, work across three different axes. We've talked about diversity and the richness of label, but of course realism is, is, is absolutely critical. Uh, you must have sufficient realism to generalize across the domain gap. Now, it doesn't mean necessarily you have to be able to pass a, a visual Turing test, um, but, uh, but you do need uh, to be able to generalize. And unfortunately, at the moment, um, the best way we know to do that is, is through empirical testing. So there's been great work in the community on this, uh, on this topic as well, um, all sorts of uh, increasing adoption um, uh, for many different tasks, especially around um, humans and, and environments uh, over the last few years. My own uh, uh, engagement with this started uh, in our CBPR 11 paper, where we, were, where we rendered uh, you know, uh, basically unlimited training data of uh, human bodies in different shapes and sizes and poses uh, that we used to train uh, the original Connect body tracking system. But more recently, we've been looking at this for hand tracking. So uh, in fact, the hand tracking I work, uh, work I showed you a moment ago, the machine learning components there were trained on synthetic data. And the really nice thing is you can start with uh, the exact parametric uh, hand model that you're tracking against and use that uh, as the basis for generating your training data. And there's several ingredients. So first of all, you need to be able to texture this. Uh, and again, we can uh, texture this with a diversity of textures from a texture library. Next, you need to be able to pose this realistically. And this is not quite as easy as just sort of randomly per permuting the joints, uh, the joint angles in your model. Uh, you need to do this with care. And uh, so we needed some motion capture data. Uh, of hands. And for this, because motion capture for hands is, is very hard to come by, we had to uh, create our own uh, capture studio, multi-camera rig. Uh, the red points here are uh, overlaying the uh, uh, stereo tracked uh, points uh, in, uh, in the data. Uh, and then we took uh, those, uh, the, the raw data, which was about 300,000 data points per frame, uh, and fitted our model, our low dimensional model to that, uh, to data using a, a sort of super powered version of the model fitting algorithm that I showed you earlier. Once you've got poses, you've got textures, I guess the, the next and last component uh, in the mixture is uh, clothing, accessories, rings, jewelry, etc. Uh, and this is uh, super, again, super important in terms of the realism and, and reducing the domain gap and ensuring this will work for a diversity of, uh, of users that we're gonna see in practice. And you throw these all together and you can start to get these kind of uh, beautiful uh, renders where I think in this case, you probably would be hard pressed to tell the difference between uh, this and real data. But of course, it's more than just uh, the, the, the data itself. It's also about the labels. And um, this is a case, uh, this is an example here where um, really using synthetic data is uh, a superpower and, and much uh, richer, allows you much richer uh, labels than you could get with uh, real data. So these are some experiments trained purely on synthetic data, tested um, on real data. This is a real sequence. And we're trying to predict, I think about 500 key points here, including front and back uh, surface of the hand. So including occluded uh, parts of the hand. Um, and it's, it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's really not 
not too bad. And uh, it, it sort of shows you, even when, the, say, the hand is uh, in a fist there, you can predict pretty reliably uh, what it's seeing. Now, of course, the uh, hands and hands and bodies are important parts of the, uh, the human, but uh, perhaps the face is even more important. And we've been working on uh, generating synthetic uh, human faces. Uh, and this is sort of the, uh, a few examples from our pipeline uh, as it stands today. And I'd like you to notice a few things about this. One, uh, the diversity in the data. We can uh, change head shape, uh, skin tone, uh, hair, beards, clothing, glasses, uh, uh, and accessories. And this, again, allows us to think about rendering really very balanced, uh, unbiased data sets. Second, uh, the labels, right? We can generate pretty amazing uh, quality labels uh, for different tasks, including, again, examples of things that are um, impossible or very hard uh, to, uh, to label by hand, such as the occluded uh, key points behind the head or the, the very detailed um, per pixel surface normal ground truth. But of course, uh, synthetic data uh, is nothing if it doesn't generalize to real data. Uh, and just to uh, high, show, show that this working, um, here's a, an example, a few examples are just taken from some stock footage of people and uh, just showing the generalization that we get. So this is purely trained on synthetic uh, and now tested on real data um, for all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of tasks here. Uh, here's surface normal estimation. Um, but it's all very well uh, generating some uh, fun videos like that, um, but does it really have a quantitative effect? And here's uh, one example of uh, a work in submission where we're able to reduce the bias in visual heart rate estimation um, by augmenting a real training set with synthetic data. Uh, so not only do we uh, aggr in aggregate reduce the error significantly, but we're also massively reducing the bias across uh, the results for different skin types. So finally, and very quickly, I want to touch on uh, neural rendering. Um, if you ha have been asleep for the last few years, you may have failed to notice the uh, amazing progress uh, in neural rendering. Um, computer vision has always been uh, interested in uh, generative models of images, um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, only until uh, the GAN models started arriving, um, uh, in, in vision that we've started to see really phenomenal progress in the community um, on this topic. Uh, and, uh, you know, progress has been, you know, you could, you could say exponential in terms of the quality uh, and variety of images that we're able to generate. More recently, we've been seeing great work uh, around how you control these and, and, and uh, actually uh, start to use these for um, uh, useful purposes and, and to, to really, and so it's starting to feel like you, you could um, plausibly think about replacing a, a, a full graphics pipeline um, with neural rendering in the, in the next few years. So um, I'm just going to show you a, a, a couple of quick pieces of work um, that we've been exploring in this space. So the first is called config and this is very much uh, along those lines of how you control uh, the neural uh, face uh, generation. Um, so uh, we're able to uh, generate, uh, get control in our latent space of head pose, lighting conditions, um, and uh, eye, eye pose, as you're seeing here, uh, semantic attributes such as hairstyle and, and facial hair, um, and uh, pose, uh, such as you're seeing here, facial expression, in other words. So under the hood, um, it looks a bit like this. I, there's a lot here and I'm not going to explain it all in detail, um, but at its heart, it's a, it's a standard uh, encoder decoder architecture. What's uh, interesting is that we're able to take the synthetic data that I showed you a moment ago um, and use the fact that we have a, a factorized uh, and controllable latent space uh, 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 and controllable set of parameters for the, those synthetic data to render a training set uh, where we know all of that and we can encode uh, we can pass that factorization on to our, a, a, a latent space ZS, which is uh, encoded using the synthetic data encoder. And then we can, by using a domain discriminator DDA here, we can ensure that the real data 
uh, in uh, latent space and the synthetic data latent space are as close as possible, which means that then we can uh, at runtime take a real image, encode it to now the shared latent space, uh, and then replace various uh, parameters uh, using uh, the synthetic data encoder. Uh, and if you do this, uh, you can start to get uh, the kinds of results that you see here. So again, head pose variation, uh, lighting variation, uh, you'll see gaze, uh, gaze control in a moment, uh, hair, uh, facial hair attributes, including some that aren't, uh, definitely aren't in our training set, uh, and uh, things like uh, facial expression as well. So that was config and a very last um, uh, uh, fun teaser to show some of the exciting work we're doing uh, to take this from 2D into 3D. Um, here's some neural rendered uh, sequences or playing back, this is playing back real motion, but in a moment we'll pause it and show we've got sort of fairly complete control of this parametrically. Um, so we're able to, uh, you know, control the, the head pose uh, and those facial expressions with an underlying parameter vector. So we're not quite ready to talk about how we're doing this yet in any detail, um, but I, I look forward to talking about that uh, at a future workshop. So that's the body of my talk. Um, I think uh, computer vision has an incredible role to play in, in uh, augmented reality and virtual reality. Uh, we've seen some examples of uh, some of that work uh, for enabling instinctual interaction on HoloLens 2 uh, and some examples of, of things that are coming uh, in the pipeline. So just uh, some closing words, HoloLens 2 is available. Uh, if if you want to buy it, you can go onto the Microsoft Store website and uh, plug in your credit card details. Uh, and at least if you're in the US, you should be able to order that soon and we'll be expanding uh, the reach of that worldwide as soon as we can. And if you want to use uh, HoloLens in your research, there's a thing called HoloLens Research Mode. Uh, and if you enable this, that starts to uh, give you access to uh, many of the uh, sensors, the raw sensor data that are coming from HoloLens, so the head tracking cameras, depth camera, uh, and IMU data. So with that, I'll say thank you very much, um, and please feel free to get in touch if you've got any questions. <laughs>